Hello, my name is Roy Parker. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I'm here today to talk about developing as a scientist and how you can, might be able to make your graduate education process better. Why is this an issue? Well, you know, 30 to 40 percent of students in PhD programs in the United States don't finish their PhDs. There's probably a lot of reasons why students don't finish, but I believe one of those reasons is because in graduate school we put a focus on winning. And winning is defined as publishing a really important paper in a high-profile journal. This can lead to frustration and dissatisfaction with students because publishing such a paper is often beyond the scope of their control and can involve luck both in the scientific process as well as in the publishing process. This is very analogous to athletic situations where uh, a focus on winning in athletics can lose to frustration and dissatisfaction when athletes lose and then leading to those athletes quitting the sport. Conversely, in science, if the whole uh, focus is to publish a really important paper, that can lead to frustration and dissatisfaction when it doesn't happen and lead to students quitting science. This analogy is useful because uh, we've learned from the study of athletic training that uh, the solution really is to emphasize skill development, not winning in training. That is, therefore, the development of a scientist really equals the development of a set of skills. That skill development would improve training, reduce frustration, and then those improved skills will lead to more winning, or in the science analogy, more important discoveries. So then to really develop your training program or to obtain a PhD, you want to identify a set of critical skills. You want to uh, make those skills explicit to the students so they know what skills they're trying to learn. And then you want to identify methods, goals, exercises to train and develop those skills and then implement those all while doing important research. Because in the end, getting a PhD is absolutely essential to do new independent research. What I've done here is try to put together a number of different skills uh, which are important for, to learn in order to develop as a scientist. If you're interested in this in more detail, I suggest you see this uh, paper published earlier this year. And what I'm going to do now is run through these skills and talk about why they're important and how you might work to develop them during your PhD training. One important skill is a broad knowledge of your field, mile wide, inch deep. This allows you to understand what's out there and so when something becomes relevant, you can know where to go look and what to learn about it. You develop such a broad knowledge from classes, you can from undergraduate textbooks, or even from teaching. And then like other things in science, you have to maintain this skill because knowledge changes over time and continues to accumulate, so you have to continue to attend seminars and journal clubs and look at the leading journals to see what's changing and what's important that you need to know about. A related skill is a wide knowledge of experimental approaches. This is important for three reasons. First, in order to know how to address the problem you're trying to solve, you need to know, be aware of the full variety of experimental approaches you could use in that setting. Second, you need to understand methods so that you can read the scientific literature and understand the strengths and weaknesses of any given manuscript that you're reading. And finally, it's important to know new approaches, existing approaches, because new technologies are developed by the combination of pre-existing technologies. And so if you have a wide awareness of what's possible now, you can consider how to apply those or combine those in new ways to develop new methods which might allow you to solve a previously untractable problem. You can develop your wide knowledge from seminars, classes, literature. Uh, it's important sometimes to write summaries of these methods so that you can remember what they are and their strengths and weaknesses. And then, again, like your basic knowledge base, you need to maintain this. You need to keep looking at what new methods are coming along, either from seminars, from reading papers, or from browsing leading methods journals. A third skill is really to have absolutely uh, terrific communication skills. And this is important for two reasons. First, you have to be able to communicate what you're doing, either in oral formats or in write written. This is how you're evaluated throughout your scientific career. More importantly, good communication skills forces you to have a strong and rigorous thinking. If you can't communicate something clearly, it's because you don't understand it clearly. Therefore, developing good communication skills forces you to develop good thinking skills. You can do this from 
both oral uh, presentations, which can be practiced in group meetings, discussions with your mentors or your peers, in journal clubs, or going to scientific conferences and presenting your work. Developing good writing skills is also part of develop your, developing your communication skills and your thinking process. This can be done by writing reviews of manuscripts, uh, mini reviews, writing proposals, writing research manuscripts as your results progress in the lab, writing summaries of papers. It's absolutely essential to develop good writing skills because this forces you to have good thinking skills. As said very eloquently by Joseph Epstein, a famous author, writing is foremost a mode of thinking and when it works well, an act of discovery. You have to be able to learn how to read, evaluate, and integrate the scientific literature. This is a skill which is learned best at three different scales. First, you have to learn how to read a single paper, and you have to learn a method. Um, and you can do this by then reviewing manuscripts, reading papers in whatever you're working on, or presenting simple journal clubs where you just talk about a single manuscript. There are lots of ways to read a scientific paper. It's important for you to find one that works great for you. Here's one website which discusses how you can do that. Uh, there are others. Develop a method for how you're going to read a scientific paper and then implement it over and over again. Once you read a paper, you're not done. You need to clarify and organize your thoughts. One very useful way to do that is to write a summary of the paper. And this, uh, a good method is to write three simple paragraphs. One, a summary paragraph, which has the main point of the paper and the evidence that supports it. A second short paragraph about the strengths and weaknesses of the paper. And finally, a paragraph about the broader implications and why this is an interesting or important paper. Such summaries do two things. One, they help you organize your thoughts. And second, they provide a resource that you can go back to whenever you need to understand that paper again uh, in a timely manner. Once you can do this at a single paper, you need to be able to do it at a larger group, uh, maybe 10 to 15 papers. This is a more realistic journal club. Writing a mini review is a good example of this. Or if you write a research manuscript, you might uh, do so in the introduction to that manuscript. At a larger scale, by the time you're getting done with your PhD, you should develop the skill to be able to read a large number of papers, maybe 15 to 100, integrate that information into uh, a greater understanding and write a research proposal about it, or maybe a review of that area on a larger scope. Two skills that are very important for you to succeed in the lab. First, you have to have very deep knowledge about what's going on in your field and the things that are pertinent to your experiments. If you don't understand in detail what you're doing and why it's important, how can you ever expect to make important contributions? So to do this, you have to first learn how to read and evaluate scientific methods, papers, as we talked about in skill four. Then you need to read papers in your field and write summaries of them. These become great resources for you to understand what you're doing as you go forward. You have to maintain this specific knowledge. You need to continue to read in your field and attend conferences in your field and uh, maintain that base knowledge as you go forward so you can be successful. A related skill is to be able to design, execute, and analyze experiments in the lab. To do this, you actually have to work in the lab. Key things to focus on are understanding what you're really doing. Know what the methods are and how they work and what's important. You need to think about what controls are important and how to integrate them into your experiment. You have to really pay attention to detail. Many experiments involve multiple steps. If you have a 5 or 10 percent error rate at any given step in an experiment, and you have 10 or 20 steps in a protocol, the chances of you executing a successful experiment become vanishingly small. It's also important, very important to have what I call open eyes. You have to see what is there, not what you expect or hope to see. This is extremely important because unexpected results or observations are often the ones that lead to a new and greater understanding of the process under investigation because they don't fit with your pre-existing model. So see what's there, and then think about what it can mean. Two final skills. One, you have to be able to have new ideas. And here, this is a choice. Creativity is a choice. You can choose to think about your observations and what they might mean, or you can just move uh, happily forward without much depth, deep thought. It's useful pointing out that new ideas often come from trying to understand a process at a causal or mechanistic level. 
And such efforts force you to think about what could be going on and therefore uh, generate new hypotheses. You can develop methods to have new hypotheses. There are several of these. Find one that works for you. One example of these is shown here and again detailed in this manuscript published earlier this year. There are several others. The important point here is for you to find a way that works for you to have new ideas uh, about the experiments you're doing. A final skill is the ability to choose important research problems. There are different approaches to this. You can choose problems that address a critical human or societal issue, that address some fundamental question which has not been solved, or that address an unexplained observation that doesn't fit with our current understanding of whatever area it's in. You need to determine what works for you. Different scientists have different affinities for different kinds of problems. Uh, think about what you like to work on and then uh, choose a method which will allow you to do this successfully. Here are two commentaries which talk about how to choose a scientific problem in a manner that fits with your, with your personality. Finally, in closing, I just want to hit the bottom line. You know, for students, getting a PhD requires more than just working in the lab. These are some of the explicit skills you should develop during your PhD training, and you can put in place methods to do that yourself. If they're not already existing in your graduate training program, talk to your mentor and develop a program that will work for you to get the training you feel you need. For mentors, you know, developing good schools, skills in your students takes effort, but if you're successful, the payback is well worth it. Thank you for your attention.